Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Faris Manus. By turns our purity inspires and our impurity casts us down. Steel isn't strong, boy. Flesh is stronger. What is steel compared to the hand that wields it? The truth is. I am Iron Man. Pharos Manus, the Gorgon of Medusa, was the Primarch of the Iron Hand's Legion of Space Marines. His hands are made of iron. His name is also Latin for Iron Hand. Real subtle, GW. He got said hands after wrestling with a silver dragon on the planet he crashed on and dipping the lizard into magma. The metallic skin of the dragon fused into the skin on his hands. Wait, living metal? That sounds oddly familiar for some reason. Anyway, his arms became so fucking hardcore that he did not even need a weapon to tear through dudes, his iron hands were more than enough. Although he is shown at one point wielding what looks like a power spanner. So in summary, Iron Hand, who had iron hands, was the leader of the iron hands would give themselves Iron Hands in honor of the Iron Hands of Iron Hand of the Iron Hands. He gets really pissed off if you call him the Hands of Fate. Ferris, using his shiny metal hands, could make epic weapons that absolutely kick ass but he only used, like, one or two of them. It's not clear as to whether he or Vulcan was the best smith. Vulcan had better aesthetics, in that he could create things that actually looked pretty instead of just ugly blocks of metal with guns haphazardly glued on, but Ferris certainly had a better way of making weapons, by punching them into shape with his bare fists. Vulcan also had a respect for geology, whereas Ferris thought that details of a metal ended at its usefulness. Vulcan was certainly better at forging healthy friendships. History. Back in the days of the Great Crusade, before the good ol' Horus heresy, Pharos met Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children beneath Mount Nirodnaya, and challenged him to forge the best weapon that he could. After three months, Fulgrim forged an ornate warhammer, while Ferris made a big blinky sword. After praising each other for their craftsmanship, the two exchanged weapons and became best bros for life, literally, in Ferris's case. Close bracket. Cuddly and friendly, however, Ferris was not. To the people of Medusa he was a grim figure who took warriors into the crypts of the Forbidden Polar Zone to fight Okitech nasties, and otherwise offered them weaponry and told them to fight to ensure they remained strong. Once he met his legion, he performed a dramatic volt face on interfering in Medusan politics. Which is to say he went from non-intervention to legionaries, take over their clans. BTW they'll only understand if you do it really violently. Nonetheless there was that one guy who took that a little far, wiping out a clan that had gone rogue and claiming their crawler for himself. As far as military doctrine went, Pharos wasn't crazy like Engron or Krill like Kurz, but he was pitiless, perhaps even more so than Russ or Horus. On the battlefield itself he was the kind of guy who could smash straight through the legs of a reaver sized titan analog, a barely disguised at homage. And Angron thought he was tough holding up a warhound. Bless. Like Vulcan, he made a point of forging gear for most of his brothers, although Vulcan was a bit uncomfortable with Ferris' way of punching metal into shape and didn't use his dragon-headed flamer until the heresy broke out. Examples of his work include Horus Sword, which Horus favored until the Emperor gave him World Breaker, Fireblade, the aforementioned sword made for Fulgrim, and Lorgas Mace Aluminarum. Despite his rigidness and temper Ferris could be reasonable. When he heard that the Emperor was going to retire from the Great Crusade and leave one of the Primarchs in command, Ferris Manus decided that it had to be him. He tried to prove the point by leading a joint force of Iron Hands, Emperor's Children, Thousand Sons and Ultramarines into battle against a technologically equivalent human empire that had been causing the Ultramarines some problems. Ferris figured that he could take command of the campaign and be done with it before Gilliman showed up with the rest of the Zeith Legion to finish the job. Unfortunately he lost his cool after his enemies tried to sue for peace then attempted to assassinate him. Deciding that he didn't have the patience trying to fight in the same manner as his brothers, he laid the world to waste, demolishing its population and its infrastructure. 
Gitterman was pissed when he finally did show up since the world could have become a tremendous asset to the Imperium. But by that point Ferris Manus had decided he was better at being a conqueror rather than a leader and chose to stand back and wholeheartedly support whoever did get promoted to Warmaster. Humorously, when Fulgrim told Ferris that Gilliman actually did consider him to be one of the greatest Primarchs among them, Ferris responded that the thought was not reciprocated, it was, but Ferris was too stubborn to say so. Ferris constantly wanted to compare himself to his brothers, turning everything into some kind of competition. He built an arena on his flagship that outsiders figured was for dueling dreadnoughts, it was actually for him to spar against other Primarchs though was disappointed that his brothers were reluctant to test themselves against him. Even offering Vulcan a better weapon than the fireblade he forged for Fulgrim didn't get him the scrap he wanted. No doubt this was part of his zealous drive to test his own limits, as when an enemy sicker sifted through his mind to find moments of weakness to use against him, he only found that Ferris actually cherished his defeat since they allowed him the room to grow, and so he actively sought greater challenges to throw himself against. He even figured that if he was to get a second duel against the Emperor, the outcome would be different. Horus Heresy. It all went well until Fulgrim found a new boyfriend girlfriend hermaphroditic freak, and decided to make Ferris join the dark side. Fulgrim totally outmatched Ferris with his hotness but Ferris wasn't interested and they had a fight. Ferris twisted apart the sword he made for his now ex-boyfriend with his own hands, in response Fulgrim reclaimed his brother's warhammer and knocked him out with it. When the Horus Heresy officially started, Ferris impatiently charged off with his fastest ships and his most baddest of veterans, leaving the bulk of his legion behind, in order to give his traitorous brothers a boot and arrived at the face-off at Istvan V. It started well, Ferris brought his army down right at the edge of the enemy's shields, and forced Horus troops into retreat despite all the shenanigans the traitors pulled. But then they got totally fucked up by a bunch of reinforcements while Ferris challenged Fulgrim. The prancing ninny was on the verge of getting his ass handed to him. Until he became Slanesh's boyfriend for real and proceeded to cut Ferris Manus's head off. Well, it depends on who's writing it, in most Ferris was losing even before his glorious haircut. Ferris death was said to include great flashes of light, but the Inquisition isn't helping with research. Horus was pretty fucking pissed at this. Ironically, Ferris' death was caused by the same self-flagellating urge that drives his sons to turn themselves into cyborgs. When Fulgrim came to convert him to Horus' side, Ferris thought this meant there was some flaw inside him that needed to be expunged by killing Fulgrim. This was why the Iron Hand stayed in the field when everyone else disengaged and got screwed over harder than everyone else. Well, the Salamanders taking a nuke aside. Despite his anger at Fulgrim, or perhaps because of it, Horus kept Ferris's head, removing the remaining flesh and leaving it a bleached skull for his throne. Sometimes he would talk to it, lamenting that he had nothing but dishonored and broken psychopaths on his side instead of angels and strategists as his generals. Waging a galaxy-wide heresy is a tough job. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Ferris lives? There is speculation, in universe and out, that Ferris Manus somehow lives, and is hidden away on Mars by the Adeptus Mechanicus, though mentioning this to the Iron Hand gets them impressively angry, to the point that they might demonstrate how they think otherwise by using the speaker's own head. The marines who survived the dropsite massacre were in no doubt, having seen the visual evidence from multiple angles, but apparently the Iron Hands found the files too depressing and set about wiping their hard drive with a bolter. That being said, the Horus Heresy book series might currently be sowing multiple seeds of some sort of truth to the rumor. Firstly, Fulgrim regretted not being able to convince Ferris Manus into joining the side of the traitors, 
and so had Fabius Bile attempt to clone his brother with all of his memories intact so that Fulgrim might try again at turning Ferris to chaos. This did not work as the cloned Ferris would become hostile at the suggestion of turning traitor and would have to be killed by demon Fulgrim. That didn't stop Fulgrim from trying again and again, believing that Fabius cloning methods resulted in imperfect clones and so ordered him to try harder and create more, though fortunately, each one would get angry at the attempt to turn him away from the Emperor and end up getting beaten to death by his now ascended brother. Guess even demon primarchs can stay butthurt for millennium on end. Another thing to note is that the Ferris Manus clones did not have the metallic arms of the original which is obvious since the original was not born with them either and only acquired them later in life. This fact was hidden from the clones by making them wear gauntlets, which the clones found confusing. The original Ferris never needed gauntlets for protection since the metal skin was protective enough, but ended up rolling with, since their lives tended to be measured in hours. Secondly, the Iron Hands did manage to salvage one of the broken hands of Ferris Manus from the battlefield of Eistvan V. The Iron Fathers of the Legion built a cult around it like it was some sort of relic and used it as the starting point for them constructing a mechanical golem creature that would act as a facsimile for the Gorgon that would issue orders by gesturing with its hand like some sort of paralytic invalid. Other than the hand, this new creature was unrecognizable as the Primarch that the arm had come from. Vulcan considered it an insult to the Emperor and his brother's memory and promptly destroyed it with his hammer. It is strongly hinted that the Mechanicum may have had something to do with the personality cult of the Gorgon Golem as the Iron Fathers of the Legion seem to come back changed after receiving their mechanical upgrades from the Tech Adepts during the Horus Heresy. This hints that the Mechanicum might have been trying to subvert the XTH Legion to their own causes even while Galactic Civil War was going on around them. Even though Vulcan destroyed the creature, whatever influence the Mechanicum had on the Legion likely remained, as the Iron Fathers abandoned their tear and born Warlader Shadrach Medicine not long afterwards and went their own way. What happened to the other metallic arm remains a mystery but a number of interested parties somehow cut shavings off them, finger bones, to use in the edges of ritual blades. Thirdly, the head of Ferris Manus was later returned to the Iron Hands just prior to the second founding as part of a pact between the fractious Shattered Legion and Gilliman and Dawn to ensure their compliance with the Codex starts. How the two Primarchs got their brother's head when it was in the possession of Horus is yet unknown. Fourthly, in Master of Mankind, the Emperor summoned an army of black fiery space marines and flame wreathed custards to hold back the tide of demons and chaos forces from breaching the webway and swarming terror. Buying time for the custodes and other imperials to withdraw and seal the webway entrance, they were conspicuously led by a giant with silver arms and a hammer, hell, the giant is even referred to as the tenth son of a dying empire, so briefly reborn in his father's immolating wrath. Suffice to say there is enough evidence of Ferris Manus's physical remains surviving in various states of cloned reanimation or ghoulish undeath that it is definitely feasible for outside observers to get the wrong end of the stick and believe that he survived much longer than he actually did. The original Ferris Manus was hacked to pieces by traitor marines after being decapitated, with many taking away parts as trophies and Fulgrim likely taking some parts to remember him by. The flesh is... strong? Being the hardest flesh haters that the Iron Hands are, one would suspect that Ferris Manus might as well have been called Ferris Clunus when it comes to the weakness of the flesh. In reality this is about as far from the reality as possible. The following is taken from the preface to a novel where the Iron Hands are portrayed as emotionless, flesh hating, misanthropes. They are not my hands. This fact is forgotten by my brothers, inexplicably, it has always seemed to me. The hands are strong, to be sure, and have created great things for us all, but they are not mine. And that counts for something. They forget that the silver on my arms comes from a beast that I vanquished. It is the mark of a great evil that I ended, and yet it persists within me. I would struggle to remove it now. I will not remove the silver from my flesh because I have learned to depend on it. The fault is with my mind. I rely on the augmentation given to me by my metal gauntlets, so much so that the flesh beneath them is now little more than a distant memory. A day will come when I will strip it from me, lest I lose the power to master myself forever.
Already my legion's warriors replace their shield hands with metal in my honor, and so they too are learning to doubt the natural strength of their bodies. They must be weaned off this practice before it becomes a mania for them. Hatred of what is natural, of what is human, is the first and greatest of the corruptions. So I record it here, when the time comes, I will strip my hands of their unnatural silver. I will instruct my legion to recant their distrust of the flesh. I will turn them away from the gifts of the machine and bid them relearn the mysteries of flesh, bone and blood. When my father's crusade is over, this shall be my sacred task. When the fighting is done, I shall cure my legion and myself. For if fighting is all there is, if we may never pause to reflect on what such devotion to strength is doing to us, then our compulsion will only grow. Already I see the madness that path leads to, and so I shall excise the silver from my hands. In doing so I shall weaken myself and my sons, but nonetheless it must be done. The hands are strong, and have created great things, but they are not mine. Pharos Manus, talking about how he was totally going to get rid of his silvered hands, any day now, I'm serious guys I'm going to do it, just not right now, but later, I swear I'll get rid of them. With what the iron hands now do by turning themselves into cyborgs, with only part of their brains being flesh, is as big of a fuck you to the Primarch as possible. If anything, they took his receiving a Viking crew cut courtesy of his once best friend as a byproduct of his own emotional reactions, which only made them hate human weakness even more. In any case, it puts the iron hands in an interesting light. Having his entire legion pay no attention to his thoughts on cybernetics also secures his position as most ignorable Primarch in universe. This perfectly matches how real life fans in GW have, not, thought about him for years. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the not a fiction bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.